Well, welcome everyone. I'm glad uh, to, that we are all gathered today and we are on the second part of a uh, pretty intriguing series. Um, and I, I listened to uh, part of um, uh, last week and so um, starting, uh, continuing this, uh, um, this series on when religion becomes evil uh, based off uh, the book. Um, I have a different cover because <laughs> when did he publish this? It was after 9-11, I know. Yeah, 2002 was the first edition. And so, and then the red book is the um, second printing. Yeah. Um, but it is a, a, um, a great book. It's a great, fascinating stuff. And again, going over the five uh, warning signs. So today we'll be looking at the second one. Um, so let's uh, join together in prayer first. Oh, gracious, loving God, we give you thanks as we come together for another um, Tuesday evening class uh, to engage and to um, uh, uh, broaden our understanding and, and, and our uh, scope and uh, really engage what it means to uh, be a community of faith and to, and to look upon uh, religion uh, with open minds and a critical mind. Lord, we pray that your spirit uh, lead us and guide us uh, during these times and uh, as we go through uh, this uh, session uh, today. May your spirit uh, be our teacher as always. We pray all this in your son's precious name. Amen. 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 So, um, uh, as you probably noticed that we have, there, there's five warning signs that, that Charles Kimball uh, lists in the book. Um, uh, absolute truth claims, blind obedience, establishing the ideal time when the end justifies the means, um, and declaring holy war. So those are the five um, uh, typical critical um, warning signs of, of when religion kind of tends to be dang become dangerous. And so, but then we're covering five warning signs in four weeks. And so there's a mathematical challenge here, right? <laughs> and so whoever told you that, I'm talking about absolute truth, right? The, what is truth, right? It's, what are some of the things that we, would, we think is true? I remember um, you know, you put, when you think, well, what are some of the things that you would say it's absolutely true? Gravity. Gravity. Well, that's actually still a theory. <laughs> it's a theory of gravity, right? Yeah. You know, I used to go around saying, well, how about some of the, the most basic thing, like one plus one equals two. Isn't that true? Well, I thought so until I, m one of my last math classes that I had to take uh, in college was called Fundamentals of Arithmetic. And in that class, you had to prove that one plus one equals two. It's not a given. <laughs> and so even the ba very basic things that we think is true, what do we really know is true? And so anyhow, that was last week though. And so today we're gonna go to um, um, the second one. Uh, so again, we're covering five warning signs in four weeks. Today we'll be covering uh, the second one, blind obedience. And next week, I'm going to combine uh, three and four because those are shorter chapters on um, um, uh, defining ideal time and when the ends justify the means, which are always, you know, um, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> don't do that. Anyhow, <clears throat> and so, uh, so today we'll be um, covering the, the uh, topic on uh, blind obedience. All right, so we're going to start off, and again, this is based off, uh, again, uh, Charles Kimball's book, and, we're gonna, and he starts off this chapter with a, um, uh, a case study. There's several case studies that are very intriguing. Um, this one I wasn't very familiar with, but it starts off with a, uh, a case study in Japan back in 80, uh, 95 uh, by this group called Aum uh, Shirinkyo, and it was, I remember vaguely in the news, um, it, was, um, you th it was a, uh, a terrorist attempt, attack. Um, what happened is that this group of people, um, the followers of, um, of, it's led by a, a man named Shoko Asahara, and this group went and released a toxin called Saren into the subway system in Japan. Now, if you've ever been to Japan and know those Jap Japanese um, uh, subway system during rush hour, oh my gosh, right? Because you know how they pack people in. They actually have people who are called pushers. 
You know, their job is to push people in before the doors close. So imagine releasing a, um, a, um, a toxin called sarin, which is actually a, um, a toxin that is categorized as a weapon of mass destruction. They released it into the, uh, the subway systems on March 20th, um, 95. Uh, it only killed 14, but there were hundreds, thousands of people that were injured for, by it. And, um, and again, if you add up even those who were severely injured, many of the ones that are 50 people who were severely injured were permanently injured for the rest of their life. Um, eyesight, uh, lungs, and all that stuff. It's, it's one that, um, yeah, it's, I don't have to go into the details of how toxic it is. Uh, but what that, that, what that did was, uh, in the culture of Japan, in, in that society, it was something that it, it was unheard of. You know? It's almost as if today, it's, al it's, it's almost as if you know, we, get, uh, you, we hear on the news of a shooting. And what, are, what is our response today? Ah, another one. And how sad is that, right? And I remember after the um, um, Uvalde uh, incident in Texas, you know, a couple weeks ago, there was in a a um, a, uh, a video of a counselor, a child uh, psychologist counselor, who was interviewing, uh, who was uh, actually she put out a video after um, talking to one of her you know, client students, child, a ten-year-old about the incident and kind of talking and asking um, how they felt. And, and the child's response to the, the counselor was, you know, don't, don't feel bad because, you know, when it happens, I'll know what to do. And the counselor put on the video, it's like she, she said that after that counseling session with the child, she just cried and cried and cried because she said, she asked, when did all of a sudden a situation like a mass shooting at school is not a, oh my goodness, how could this happen if it happens to a when it happens? That the child used the words, when it happens, we'll know what to do. So again, um, these situations, these, um, this horrific violent situations. And so again, uh, what happened here was that it was this group, um, uh, Aum Shirin Kyo, that uh, founded by Shoko Asahara in 87, a huge number of following, about 10,000 followers in Japan, 30,000 in, in, in Russia, drawing upon the teachings of you know, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, and it was basically a message that was uh, about you know, I ideal society that would naturally propagate. But the thing that really got to the, um, uh, the, the investigators about what caused this, you know, how do you get uh, these people, these followers, to do such a horrific act, it all boiled down to the fact that he, part of that, um, his teaching was that the followers, basically his words were basically divine. That there was, un, the, the un, there was he demanded unquestioning devotion to whatever he dictated. And so th that's where we come to today's um, uh, session on uh, blind obedience, you know? When we think of blind obedience, like, well, of course, you know, who would, who would just blindly follow someone, right? Follow a, a leader. And yet, so much of our religion, if you really think about it, even in just our Christ, Christian um, um, denominations, you know, a lot of people read scripture and just um, recite scripture without really thinking about what it really means, right? And, that was part of the absolute, you know, uh, uh, trying to understand what is truth. Well, the key idea in this second um, concept is uh, he, Charles Kimball writes in page 72, authentic religion engages the intellect as people wrestle with the mystery of existence and the challenges of living in an imperfect world. We live in an imperfect world. We get that, right? Conversely, blind Obedience is a sure sign of uh, corrupt religion. So for anyone to say, you know, this is what everyone needs to do and not to even question that, basically it's, it's tying into 
last week's lesson of, well, you know, if you're going to follow something blindly, you're assuming that whatever that instruction is, is an absolute truth, right? So, uh, Charles Kimball uh, begins by kind of defining and kind of giving uh, a look at these different groups, different religions, different um, um, communities, uh, religious communities. And he begins by kind of defining um, the, the, the concept of sex and, and cult. And a lot of times, we, you know, the, this term actually has a negative connotation, right? Um, he defines it, a sect is an alternative religious organization with a traditional belief and practices. So when we think of like, um, even within our, uh, well, when we studied uh, Judaism, right? J the Jewish community had different groupings. The Pharisees was a sect, the Sadducees was a sect, you know, the, the Essenes, and, and so all religious communities have sex. You can say that the different denominations within Christianity are sex, right? Um, so, the, 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 you know, having various, uh, slight alternative variations within religious organizations are, are called sex. Cults, on the other hand, derive, uh, deviate a little bit more from the traditional teachings and, um, you know, by virtue of novel beliefs and practices. And so, with those connotations, though, you have to also realize that, as I said, many of our world religions, majority of our religious organizations, traditions, have all, be be all began from these, whether it be a small sect or a small cult. Um, they're all small movements, you know, inspired by individuals or groups of people, right? And if you really think about it, you know, uh, what they teach are rarely novel ideas. Right? All these groups, throughout history, small groups will always spawn off. And the leaders of these sects or cults, um, it's not necessarily that they come up with something that is totally brand new. You know, someone once said, you know, well, the writer of Ecclesiastes, remember what he said? There's nothing new under the sun, right? Vanities, vanities, everything repeats itself in many ways. Yes, all the religions and all the sects kind of are along the same line. However, what sects uh, and cults kind of do is that they, they're branches, right? And it always be in, it's always uh, kind of developed when they provide a, some sort of a, a, a needed correction to an established religion, right? An example, you know, Christianity grew out of the Judaism, right? And, you know, Jesus never went around saying, I'm going to start a Christian religion, right? No, he came and he was talking, he was teaching through the Jewish faith, Jewish tradition and culture, um, and, and, and so it was a movement called the way, right? Um, Charles Kimball talks about, you know, Siddhartha Gautama, Buddha, was a seeker within the Hindu tradition, right? Muslims understand uh, Islam as, as having developed through a long succession uh, of prophets, starting with Adam, actually, go all the way back, right? That Adam was the first prophet, and he just keeps on going. Um, and of course, in our Methodist tradition, John Wesley, right? He didn't, he didn't start off thinking he's going to start a, a Methodist sect. John Wesley was an Anglican priest, and all, what he was seeking to do was to reform, to, to revitalize the church, revitalize the, the Anglican church. And so that's how these branches work. And so, in many ways, there's always new religions and new sects, new cults. You know, again, you have to kind of you have to move away from the connotation, but new, new, new branches that are always being birthed constantly. Many flourish for a while, and a lot of them, like empires rise and empires. There are a lot of these groups that come about, and they, you know flourish for a while and then some of them disappear, right? Now the ones that last for a long time, the ones that, you know, uh, last for years or even centuries, and that's how we get to the major religions because they, they, they've, you know, last the test of time, right? Centuries. Well, those major religions are always spawning new branches and not isolating all only believing in the same thing, right? So there's, 
in, in the process that that happens is that it allows for variation. So when we talk about blind obedience, what, we're, what we see here is, so here's the clear warning signs of a cultic behavior that group or religions or sects that start to, to become dangerous refuse to allow for variations, right? Again, kind of tying back to last week's lesson on absolute truth. The, the leader or the group claims to have the answer, <laughs> right? And you cannot deviate from that. And it becomes, uh, well, there are, there are consequences for deviating. So they don't, they, they don't allow for variation. And, and the way they do that is, one, well, flip it, uh, they, they demand unquestioning commitment. In other words, don't question what the leader or the leaders say is the way, right? And two, they then de withdraw from the larger society. Why? To avoid that questioning. That's what leads to, well, beginnings of this concept of um, blind obedience. So let's look at one that is a, a case study. Well, we all know about this, right? Okay, that means we are old enough to know about this. <laughs> um, Jim Jones uh, and the People's Temple. You know, born in India during the Depression, 1931, I think, was when he was born. Um, started his ministry in 54 after preaching in a Pentecostal church. And remember, the Pentecost, well, the Pentecostal movement actually started, that, that branched out of the Methodist church. You know, it was part of the holiness movement. So he, he, so he kind of branched out of the, um, the Pentecostal church. And, and, and when he preached, he, he had a very social justice mindset. He preached about equality, racial equality. He wanted full integration among the, um, uh, among the, uh, the white and the black during the 50s. Well, that is a novel concept back then, right? Now, we, we listen today and we would say, yeah, that's, we would agree with what he was preaching. So that's what he was preaching, but it was, it was too radical at that time. Um, the Pentecostal church was uncomfortable with his teaching, but the Disciples of Christ church, uh, the, what we call the Christian church, um, not the Christian church, but it is a <laughs> denomination, the Disciples of Christ, uh, they did ordain Jones. Now, the interesting thing uh, about that, because the Disciples of Christ went through their uh, 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 reformation um, in their ordination process because of this. Because back then, they didn't question, uh, did it? there was not a, an educational requirement. And so that was one of the things. They, they uh, ordained Jones without checking his uh, educational background, his psychological state. Anyhow, um, so he was ordained. He started the church, um, the People's Temple, and um, you know, it started to flourish. In 65, you know, again, he, he, the church was in Indiana, but Indiana tends to be a bit more conservative than California, and because, <laughs> really, started getting some pushback, and so in 65, they moved out to California, thinking, well, Californians will, you know, uh, will support um, equality, which we do, but even here, um, as they gathered, what they ended up doing is that the, that the, that the, um, the, the People's Temple followers started to commune together and started to create these living communities, right? These, these communal settings where, and, and um, uh, they would come together, they would pretty much devote all of their income, they would sell their properties and uh, give it to the church. They would even um, sign off their insurance policies to it. Now you would think, are red flags going off at this point? And yet, there are passages in scripture, you know? Um, in fact, this coming Sunday, I'm using one of those passages for, the, uh, for my Sunday sermon. Acts chapter 2, after the Pentecost, right? The, the, the disciples, they all gather together, and, 
And Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47 starts, um, it, it says, you know, and the disciples, devo or, 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 or the people, they devoted to the, the disciples' teaching, and, and they shared everything in, um, and, and had, had, had everything in common that they broke bread together, they, uh, they ate together, they, they, they studied together, they did everything together. And then in chapter 4, it, it gets even more detailed how, how the early church community pretty much was like this. In fact, they, the, I would say Jim Jones used that passage where it talks about a community come together where they had nothing, to, um, it was a, is that what you call socialist community? They had nothing that was individual. Everything was given to the common good. Yeah, communism, okay, communism. Is that where the word come from? Communism, commune, community. Yeah, everything belonged, and, and, so, and so that's what it was. It's in our biblical teachings. But it goes a little bit too far, doesn't it? And so um, they, they, there were complaints. There were complaints. Um, uh, there was scrutiny from, from relatives of the people who were uh, uh, joining this people's um, temple. And so in 75, Jones and a small group moved to Guyana, which is just north of Brazil, I think, um, in South America, establishes Jonestown. And by 77, the, the population, you know, he went down there with 50 people. But apparently, people started to keep on moving there because by 77, there was over 1,000 people there and they had this community and they established this this um, settlement but then by that time something happens again they moved out of the United States because they were feeling the pressure of um, uh, criticism and scrutiny of of the, the, the communities that were living I mean granted yeah America 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 is pretty um, uh, defensive against communist societal living, and so so they moved out, and but then and so then, um, as when they established down in South America, Jim Jones's message started to start, start to change, and instead of talking about social justice, it became more of rants, and they, they talk about how. Uh, he would uh, um, uh, blare the message on loudspeakers throughout the compound, and it would be rant against the sky god, that the sky god has um, failed them, that the sky god was not protecting them, that the sky god has turned the, that the sky god had turned its back against the 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 the, the people, but he he will save them. He becomes the divine figure. And he becomes, and that's the message. And the people listen to that, listen to that. Um, and of course, stories of abuse, you know, led to, so in, in, in 78, led to uh, a fact-finding mission by the congressman, um, Leo Ryan. And when he went there, he found several people in the compound who were not quite comfortable, wanted to leave, but realized that they couldn't leave. And so in, on November 1878, as he was trying to leave, trying to get some of these out on the runway, um, he was killed. And that same day, Jones had everyone drink that, yeah, cyanide, right, Kool-Aid or something, um, as well as being injected. And almost 1,000 people committed, well, it's called a mass murder suicide because some were forced to drink that while others voluntarily drank that. I don't know if you can see that picture. I thought that was, I don't know. I, I kind of questioned whether I wanted to put that picture. Those are all dead bodies just lying there from dr having drunk and just fallen. A thousand people. What leads to that type of how do people, what, what makes people follow someone like that and end up in such a, um, uh, a consequence? Well, Charles Kimball, 
indicates their, their key indicators for blind obedience. The first one is an enslavement, he, he calls it enslavement to doctrine. And but what he means by that is um, uh, a, 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 a teaching or, 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 or a doctrinal statement that um, the leader would have special knowledge of or would, um, would push that no one is allowed to refute, right? So enslavement to a teaching, enslavement to a doctrine. And so, and, and a lot of these um, sects that, tend, that become destructive and violent, a lot of them are commonality have this obsession with the end times. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that next week with the, uh, the idea of time. But if you think about it, you know, even Jim Jones, he, towards the end, he frequently talked about a cataclysmic end, that there would be an apocalypse, and that, that because of, um, uh, 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 that, that the world is so corrupt that a day will come when the divine or the whole world will come to an end, but he has the special knowledge of a way out. That those who follow him will be, even if they physically die, they would be saved. Now think about that and how that message kind of teeters even to some of our fundamentalist, well, very fundamentalist Christian teachings, right? If you believe in Jesus, you are saved. And it is like a formula. A lot of these teachings or these, these, uh, these doctrines tend to be formulaic, right? And so then, again, a lot of them um, um, has this, 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 this tie into an, an end time or a, uh, uh, an apocalyptic message. The other thing, uh, again, is it discourages. It discourages questioning or challenging of the leader's knowledge. Um, and so, you know, uh, Charles Kimball indicates that authentic religion encourages questioning. And this is where I think it's critical um, in our faith and especially, you know, as the reason why uh, I, I encourage people to Take these classes, right? Be part of, um, don't just sit in church and just listen to a sermon. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But <laughs> because sermons are one directional, right? And, and, and well, here, a, a little side note. When, when I was called to ministry, or when I started to uh, perceive my calling into ministry, I really struggled with that. I fought that. <laughs> I didn't want to be a minister. Why? It, it wasn't the ministry. I love doing the ministry. I love leading Bible studies. I love doing, you know, um, uh, serving in the church and stuff like that. I just couldn't see myself preaching. That was my, that was the hardest thing I could get myself to do. And the reason why I couldn't see myself preaching was because in my, my upbringing, I grew up in, a, uh, in an ethnic, you know, a Korean church. And in a, a lot of the ethnic churches, the image of the preacher is that of a herald, okay? We call that the herald model preaching. And the herald model preaching is, that, is, is like that of a, like the, like the prophets of the Old Testament. Thus says the Lord, this is what God says. And I was like, yeah, I, yeah I'm not gonna speak for God. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are some of the models that still exist today in, in, in some of our churches. I struggle with it, and, and that's why for me, um, it, you know, when I went through seminary, there were other models of preaching. And for me, the model that I gravitated to is, for me, preaching is witness. I'm just sharing my experience and my story of how I understand God and, and my experience of what it means to be a person of faith. And I just hope that that resonates with the people. But it's not where I'm going to be telling you this is what you need to believe. Because I don't feel comfortable doing that, right? Well, unfortunately, not all 
not all traditions, you know, th there are still traditions where it is a very much a top-down model. And so um, Charles Kimball does say that authentic religion encourages questioning. When, uh, when, author when authority figures discourage or disavow honest question, something is clearly wrong. So don't be afraid to ask questions and challenge. Doctrinal positions supporting unethical behavior must always be challenged, and he writes that. Because again, if you look at some of these case studies, right, the, the followers at Jonestown, they were afraid to challenge, right? Now granted, a lot of times what happens with these communities is that not only do they start isolating themselves from the, the greater society, but they become very defensive. And by being defensive, um, what we'll see, uh, one of the other case studies that I'll talk about is uh, uh, Waco, Texas, right? Mm -hmm. The Branch Davidian, where they stockpiled weapons, right? And so then you c there's, there's another factor here that, that, that it reinforces obedience, blind obedience, is fear, right? You scare people into o obeying, right? And then the other one, withdrawing from so larger society. And this is, a, this is a real key indicator of um, religious communities that um, doesn't have that safeguard. There's a typical pattern. That, uh, there's a typical pattern of how these religious communities uh, kind of start isolating itself. By, uh, by withdrawing from larger society, it's basically isolating itself so that the, the, the leadership or the teachings can pretty much be controlled, right? If, if, uh, you, you create a, a, a petri dish, right, where it, we, we, where it restricts others. But there's a pattern of how this happens. It just doesn't happen in, in, in a whim. You know, if someone just goes or, um, um, comes about and, and just says, okay, I'm gonna start a group and then, you know, everyone, you guys have to listen to what I say and only what I say, most people are gonna be like, no, right? It's a gradual process. And it, it starts, usually, you know, these, these communities, um, as Charles Kimball talks about in his research, the typical pattern is that a lot of these groups begin with very noble programs, right? Just like what Jim Jones's um, initial preaching and his teachings were about racial equality, you know, justice. You know, it, he, he preached against the, 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 the inequalities of, of people economically and, you know, just within society. Those are noble teachings that, that draw people, to, right? into these, um, um, to the group. You know, it's programs that reform societal problems. You could say that John Wesley did the same thing, right? When he, he started preaching to the people in the fields and in the coal mines, right? He was addressing a, 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 a challenge in the church at that time by reaching out to those that were disenfranchised. So, in that sense, it all kind of started the same way. But then, it starts to, this is where the deviation starts. These, these uh, groups that tend to become dangerous start to paint a picture of the rest of the world as being evil. You know, I'm always cautious when, um, you know, sometimes they're, uh, there's a, there's a sticker that was popular about, I don't know, five, ten years ago. It's, it's, it's actually a Christian um, sticker called, Not of This World. I don't know if you've ever seen that, right? And there's this, there's this promotion that says, yeah, we're not part of this world as Christians because, you know, well, it, it's taking the phrase that Jesus said when Jesus was being uh, uh, questioned by Pontius Pilate, you know, right before he was um, uh, crucified. And Jesus' response, you know, Pontius Pilate asked uh, Jesus, uh, you, know, you know, they're accusing you of that you're the king. And Jesus' response is, 
my kingdom is not of this world. That's what Jesus said, and of course that phrase. But, uh, but what happens is that, uh, that that phrase sometimes gets misrepresented or mistaught, I guess, where by saying that we're not of this world, it creates this, this sense that, you know what? Nothing that happens in this world matters because I'm not part of this. I don't have to, I don't have to abide by the laws and the structures and the society norms because I am a little different. Well, a lot of these groups starts to paint the larger society world as being evil and that we are not going to follow the, the patterns of this world. Right? And the third thing, it starts to then cite specifics, individuals, institutions in the larger societies as, as being adversarial. So then you create this, this um, uh, battle, this challenge, right, to, to push, to really fight against the, the larger society, which then ultimately then becomes, um, they begin physically withdrawing from the society. If you really think about it, you know, this creating a, 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 um, a separate a, a dichotomy, a community, it's not all wrong. Because if you really think about it, every religious tradition, you know, every religious tradition has that concept that, you know what, there is something wrong with the world. We acknowledge that. I don't think anyone would say that, yeah, this world is perfect, and this is, this is you know, Eden never got messed up. <laughs> would anyone say that? No, we all acknowledge there are some things that are wrong. You know, we read the book of Job, and yes, you know, there are, there are suffering in this world. There are, there are questions of why, you know, there, there, there are issues with society. There are issues with um, communities. There are issues with people. There are issues with us as individuals. We acknowledge that. But then the question is, how do we then live in this world while still upholding or, or and, and, and um, uh, exercising the disciplines that help us to grow in that community. And so if you think about it, our communities are faith, right? Churches, mosques, and synagogues, we gather, you know, whether it be on Sunday mornings or on Sabbath or some other days, um, as specifically as a community. And when we do that, we do that to kind of say, okay, to remind ourselves, this is what it means to be within the community of faith, right? And hopefully, you know, when we get together, yes, we love to sing songs, we love to eat, yes. Um, but it is a reminder of what it means to be part of a community that upholds certain values, certain values that we would say is either lacking or um, just we could have a little bit more of, right? So when we come to church, we hope that we are building a community that is, that, is, uh, that is living out the love of God, right? That living out the, the, uh, the, the teachings of, of Jesus where, you know, talks about, you know, um, uh, where we're exercising compassion and justice within that community. Even though as we go leave the church to continue to exercise that outside, we come to church to kind of, oh, almost like a, a refresher, a reminder, and a re, yeah, a reminder, re-energize, revitalize our faith so that we can act, continue to uh, spread that message outside. So there is this back and forth. Do you, you get what I'm saying? Okay. And then there are other communities that really set apart, right? Um, uh, the Amish, you know, they, for them, it's, it's, it's taking a bit further and to uh, uh, create their own community, their, even their daily living, right? So for us, yes, um, even though I preached this past Sunday that you know, spiritual growth can't happen just one hour a week because it'll take you 192 years. Um, even though, um, you know, but for us, we come together for a limited time but still live the rest of our lives in the context of the greater society, 
There are other groups where they try to create that, um, that, that, that cohesive, cohesive society much more intentionally, right? So like the Amish community or the monastic communities. And yet, we wouldn't say that any of these are cults, yeah. cultic, or dangerous, right? Why not? There's something else that has to happen, right? When does the separation become dangerous? And so here we look at the Branch Davidian and what happened there, right? That group, again, it's, it's, par, it, it was, it's an offshoot of our, one of our mainline traditions, main, more, that's not mainline, but one of our uh, branches of Christianity, right? The Seventh-day Adventists. Um, my best friend when I was in, at Wesley Seminary was a Seventh-day Adventist. You know, we get along great, you know? Um, in 19, 1935, uh, uh, the, the Mount Carmel community, uh, led by Victor uh, Huteff, uh, it, it, he's the one that first established the community in Waco, Texas. And he already had it, w it with, you know, within himself to, to kind of create this, this, uh, this community that was separated from the mainstream society, almost to create a, like a monastic or a you know, communal living type of society. It wasn't bad at that time. Um, in 55, he passes away. His wife kind of leads it for a while. The community kind of limps along until in 81, this man by the name of Vernon Ho um, Howell uh, joins the group. I didn't know this until I researched it, but I didn't realize his name, um, his original name was Vernon. Vernon claimed to be the Lamb of God, and he changed his name to David Koresh. David, a combination of King David of Israel and King Cyrus of Persia, because King Cyrus, it, when the Israelites were taken into exile uh, and, um, in Babylon, King Cyrus was the king of Persia that they defeated the, um, the, the, the Babylonians and told the people, the Israelites, to, you can, you're free, you can go back, you can reestablish, you can rebuild the temple. So King Cyrus is, is seen in uh, J Jewish tradition as being a deliverer. In fact, there's a little side note on biblical studies. A lot of the Bible passages that we read from Isaiah, that we read uh, during Christmas time, that talks about a child will be born and that he will be the savior and deliverer, it's actually talking about King Cyrus. <laughs> In the Jewish tradition, it's all about King Cyrus because he was the one, he was a new uh, um, king that was being born at that time and that when he rose up, he, and he became a king at a very young age, so before he could learn to eat curd. So anyhow, so in the Jewish tradition, they read that um, Isaiah passage, not thinking of Jesus, you know, um, 400 years later, but they're thinking in terms of King Cyrus. So King Cyrus and King David are very important figures, and David Koresh takes both of their names, David Koresh, or Cyrus. Um, and he begins preaching, just like Jim Jones, about Armageddon, about the end times. Oh, and he announces that he is the one that, is, that the book of Revelation writes about, that he is the Lamb of God, that's what he said, he is the Lamb of God, that's going to be the one to open up the seven seals and interpret the skulls that will usher in the second coming of Christ. That's what he preached. Now, you would think people would be like, what? Why would you listen to something like that? And so people did. And a lot of times, you, know, you think, okay, the, the followers must be just, you know, mindless people to think that, right? But when you when, when um, investigators research all of these, um, in San Diego in, uh, what year was that? 97, 98? Mm -hmm. Haley's Comet? The, seven, the Heaven's Gate, remember that? Um, yeah, when I moved to San Diego, I was like, wow, this is the place that happened? <laughs> it's a very posh neighborhood, yeah where 38 or 39 people committed suicide when the Halley's Comet came. 
right? Hail Bob. Bob. The Hail Bob comment. A comment. Um, I remember hearing the accounts of that, and what the investigators were all um, amazed at or appalled at were that these people were not uneducated. They were professors. They were they were smart people. They were good people. What happened? How do you get from point A to point B? Same thing here. The, a lot of these followers, they, are, they become part of this community. But the problem with uh, um, uh, going from A to B is not that you're not smart enough. It's the process of thinking. They re um, groups like this, uh, they, 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 the leader is usually um, whatever the leader says, you cannot refute. You cannot question the leader. And of course, again, um, due to the apocalypse, uh, David Koresh uh, claimed to be the Lamb of God, that he had this uh, special knowledge, that he was the special one, and people started to kind of follow that. Um, and, and it, because they, they weren't allowed to question it. And then, of course, uh, because of the teaching on the Armageddon, that the apocalypse, they began to stockpile food and weapons. And then they, they believe, and <laughs> yes, he believed that he had to reestablish the house of David by procreating with spiritual wives. <laughs> Charles Wesley makes it a very good point here. He said that, it's amazing how that's another very common trait among um, these charismatic leaders that become corrupt. That they, a lot of these, a good number of these, are given like 007, a sexual license. A license to have as many wives as they want. It's a very common thing. And so he actually makes it, uh, well, if I ever go around saying, hey, hey I cannot, then, you know, s s slap me. Okay. Oh, and slap yourself, too, so don't follow that. Grace will. <laughs> Grace will slap me. There you go. Um, but it's amazing, right? But, again, uh, he was given sexual license to have as many. Jim Jones said the same thing. He does the same thing. And a lot of these... Uh, cr cr very charismatic, and a lot of them, that's the other thing, uh, a lot of these le uh, leaders tend to be very charismatic, you know, very personable. I have stories on that one too, but anyhow. Um, okay, so then in 93, you guys all know the story, this was, you know, fairly recent, or not too recent, but uh, the ATF sieged the compound, the raid lasted 51 days, leading to 76 people dying. Controversy arose because of this. You guys remember this, right? How there was controversy because you know there was they started questioning the the um, the the the, the, fed, the federal agents. Why did they have to go in? If they didn't go in, then they you know all that stuff, right? Um, because again, as I wrote there, there is no law. There was no law that Kurish broke. I mean, there's no law against claiming to be the Lamb of God. You know, there was no, there's no law against that. There's no law against having multiple sexual partners because they were all consenting. That means the adults, you know, a lot of them were married and yet educated folks, they consented to this. So it, technically he broke no law and that was the, that was the controversy. Now granted, um, the, the, the feds came back and said, okay, Maybe he didn't break the law in those areas, but because of there were children in that compound and the, the safety of those children were at issue, that was the justification for raiding. But in 95, two years after this, Timothy McVeigh bombed the um, Oklahoma City building as a uh, and he claimed to be avenging the Waco siege. Right? That's what he did. All right. So what is our responsibility? How do we, you know, how do we protect ourselves from 
being slipping into these communities that if you look at it again, there are very, there's, there's commonalities. You know, as a church, yes, we also kind of gather together as a group, right? But there's something that's dis distinctly different than, than a lot of these case studies that have gone completely off the wall, right, astray. And the primary thing is, well, first of all, primary concern arises when more, po more and more power and authority is focused on one individual. Right? Anytime you have one person in power and given ultimate authority, right, there's an issue with that. Now, if you look at some of our religious traditions, you know, we, in, in the, the Catholic Church, we have the Pope. But there are safeguards around that too, right? Yes, even though we say that the Pope has, is, the, is the head of the Catholic Church, he has, he, he, he has uh, 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 spiritual authority over, over a billion people, right? The Catholic Church has a billion people. But he cannot just do whatever he wants, right? Our bishop can't just do whatever he wants. And there's ways, there's, there, there's a safeguard. Um, I know within our United Methodist Church, you know, clergy, we can't just go whatever, I can't just preach whatever we want. You know what happens if I do that? <laughs> exactly. There's an appointment change, right? So there are safeguards around this, but a lot of these communities, they don't. So that's the one thing. The other thing is, you know, um, uh, there, there is, all religions, there's this common understanding that, um, that we have, every individual has a responsibility. We are responsible for our behavior. We can't just say, you know, because so-and-so told me to do this, uh, you do, right? We're, we're taught from a young age to think, right? Um, uh, the example that Charles, Kimball uses is, you know, parents teach their kids, you know, from an early age when the kids, you know, rebel and say, oh, but my, kid, my friends are all doing it. What is the typical response from parents? <laughs> right, if your friends jump off a cliff, would you, you know, every parent has used that line, right? It's, you know, it's, it's we we're taught early on that we should be thinking for ourselves, right? We have a responsibility for our behavior, and majority of our religions also have this, this concept where our actions matter, right? There are consequences to our actions. There are consequences here on earth, and a lot of these religions that have that concept of an, uh, of an you know, afterlife, there is a direct correlation to that, right? So a lot of these have that type of, uh, of, of connection. But the big thing is, all major religions encourage questioning and individual thinking. And if you really think about like the, like the traditions, like um, uh, the rabbinic tradition, the rabbinic tradition is a, a, a uh, it's like the Socratic method. It's, it's, it's teaching through questioning. It's always encouraging it's not a one-way communication where the teacher or the leader says what to think and you're, you're expected or forced to accept without refuting. Our, in our Methodist tradition, you know, when I teach the, uh, the, the um, uh, our Methodist theology, right, our Methodist doctrine, I taught this a couple weeks ago, right? It's online now because Mike actually made the video now. But when I teach the Methodist doctrine, one of the things that I um, tell people is the Methodist church is not a doctrinal church, meaning we don't have a, a set list of beliefs that we all have to subscribe to. The Methodist church doesn't have that. What we do have in our Book of Discipline, you know, paragraph 101 to 104, the very beginning is what we call the theological task. And what the theological task, we don't have a theological doctrine, we have a theological task. 
And what that theological task teaches us is how we're supposed to think. Not what to think, but how we're supposed to think. And it talks about our theology has to be critical. It has to be constructive, it has to be critical. The, pr uh, the practice of theology is to come to some understanding, call it a hypothesis or a theory, or, or yeah, a theory of what you think you believe in, put it into practice, and then re-theologize. We call that praxis, right? To think what you think you might believe about your faith, test it out, and then re-theologize. Don't just say, this is what I'm supposed to believe, and this is it, and it is no questions, if and buts. That's, that's not the, the Methodist way. It, our Methodist theology is, it, it's, a, it's a way of thinking, which is always test. And part of the Western quadrilateral is reason, which is to think. All major religions, but it's not just Methodism, I just kind of picked on that because, I don't know, I just know more about Methodism. But all religions encourage that type of thinking. And I want to read from you um, what Charles Kimball wrote in page 97. Because I thought he just summarized it really well. He writes, I recall well my own declaration of independence in the realm of spiritual inquiry. As a sophomore in college at Oklahoma Oklahoma State University. I was enrolled in the College of Business and on my way to a promising career in accounting. I was active in a popular uh, parachurch organization called Campus Crusade for Christ. It's a college group. Um, I had also been very involved with Young Life and in the Baptist Church in Tulsa and Stillwater. Having read virtually all the materials and the books my friends and the leaders at Campus Crusade had recommended, I decided I'd like to take a religion course in the College of Arts and Sciences. The reaction of my friends and religious leaders I knew was swift and decisive. Don't do it, they warned. Those professors will try to undermine your faith by confusing you with questions. They don't believe the Bible is true. The pressure was strong, but not compelling. I was 19 years old. I knew there was a great deal I did not know about my own religion, not to mention other traditions. Why were these people so afraid? Why would honest inquiry undermine my faith? Their protests served to convince me that my instincts were sound. I enrolled in the uh, introduction to the New Testament class, a course taught by a young assistant professor named James Kirby. Dr. Kirby helped open up the New Testament to me that semester. Even more, he taught me to learn to think critically for myself. The first time I ventured into his office, I was dumbfounded to see hanging on his wall a framed certificate of ordination from the United Methodist Church. I had no idea he was a minister. I recalled asking him what he thought personally about some of the critical questions we've been exploring in class. He responded by saying, Charles, what is important for you is what you think about these questions. I want to help you learn to ask good questions and know how to seek answers for yourself. In the final analysis, you are the one responsible for yourself. As I walked back to my room that day, I felt both exhilaration and trepidation. I knew Dr. Kirby was right. I didn't want someone else to tell me what to think. In my religious life, as in the rest of my life, I knew that I would be responsible for what I thought and said and did. I thought about my Campus Crusade friends who were so worried about my faith and correct doctrine being jeopardized. I walked across the beautiful OSU campus that day. My mother's sage advice came to life. You have to learn to think for yourself. A lot of these um, case studies, these are not uneducated folks, right? These are educated folks. They're, they're smart people, and yet, we call it group dynamics, right? Group think. When you're in that closed community, and, and that's why uh, yeah, um, one of the key indicators of that what leads to blind obedience 
is that isolation. Isolating from the larger society because then you create a closed system where the leader controls. Right? When I was learning in my religious education class at, at, at seminary, um, we, there's this thing called classical Christian education. It's, it's, a, it's a model, uh, um, um, educational model. And that education model starts off with, uh, it's broken into three phases that is developmental to the uh, children's um, uh, mental development. So in the early stages, while the kids are concrete learners, you provide um, um, the tools, right? And so in, in Christian education, it's basically the stories. You provide the stories for them to learn the stories. And, and in that part, it does seem like, okay, just, just learn the who, what, when, where, okay? Don't get into the why. Don't get into the how. Not at that too early stage because, you know, the, you, you can kind of have fun with it. But, but what you're actually doing is getting them ready for, um, and this is why I, I, spent, um, I spent a good chunk of my uh, ministry years as a youth director. I just love because at that age, because that's when it opens up. There's a reason why we do confirmation at age like 12, 13, because that's the developmental age when, that, when the, um, uh, children or youth are able to start thinking critically, analytically. And at that point, it's not about telling them what to think. It's about in, engaging the, the, the youth to start questioning. Take every single story that they learned in elementary school or, you know, or, or Sunday school and ask the questions of why, how, does that make sense? You know, why would that be? And to really engage the, 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 the children, the youth uh, at that point, to, to question everything. But then there's a third stage. And the third stage, uh, so in classical Christian education, it's, it's called the grammar stage, the dialect stage, and then the rhetoric stage. And the third stage is called the rhetoric stage. Rhetoric as in um, um, speaking, voicing, yeah, putting it together. The rhetoric stage is by the time the youth graduates from high school, by the upper, uh, upper high school um, senior years, the goal of Christian education is that every youth should be able to articulate themselves what they think, not what someone else told them, not what's, you know, it's like, okay, this was the story in the Bible, I'll just believe that just because it's written that way. No. Because they've gone through the process of re having read it, processed it, questioned it, challenged it. But the goal of Christian education is that by the time um, our, our kids graduate from high school, is so that they can articulate what they believe in. That way the faith is theirs. Not their parents, not their grandparents, not their Sunday school teacher, but theirs. And that is, I think, uh, a process that we've kind of moved away from and not really helped develop. So it's not just religious communities, but any societal yep. community. When you start having one person dictate, having too much power, that's a problem. When you well, start- Lifelong power, like we've done with Tolkien and Rajendra. Exactly. With, um, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, when you start having these life appointments or life um, authorities, you do have some issues. I mean, there's, a, there, there's, there's caution. You know, not to say that it's all bad, but there's caution. Right. Yeah. And, but again, just going back to those three things. If one person has too much power, that's a warning sign. If we're not uh, encouraged to take responsibility for our own actions, that's a problem. If we're not allowed to think for, you know, the, 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 uh, to have the freedom to question, that's a problem. Um, healthy religions, these things are, checking, uh, are kept in check. Right? All right, so next week we will cover two chapters, um, uh, establishing ideal time. You know, it's like, oh, this is the perfect time. I have stories about that. And, and then um, when the ends justify the means, which is always never a good thing. All right? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you.